Welcome to the Voodoo Power Podcast. Welcome to Plates and Pancakes. We're sitting down today with Brian Silek. Coach Silek is a strength conditioning coach along with assistant athletic director at Avila University. Silek is the first strength and conditioning coach in the history of Avila Athletics. Before coming to Avila, Silek was the wellness strength and conditioning coordinator for Park University. During his time at Park, he oversaw the strength and conditioning programs for the 2012 Men's Volleyball National Championship team and the 2013 Runners-Up team. He obtained his MS in exercise science with an emphasis in performance enhancement and injury prevention from California University of Pennsylvania. He also attended the University of Central Missouri, where he graduated the BS in exercise science with an emphasis in athletic training. Silek is a strength and conditioning coach certified through the Collegiate Strength and Conditioning Coaches Association. He is certified by the NSCA and has a CSCS, Tactical Strength and Conditioning Facilitator, and Registered Strength and Conditioning Coach. He was awarded an RSCC with a D designation signifying his continuous commitment to education and professional development. So welcome to the show, Coach. Hey, thank you very much. I'm glad I was able to have you on. Uh, you're not too far from me, so this is a pretty good deal. Yeah, we're both in Missouri. It's great. Yeah, and my, my daughter was younger. She played competitive softball, and we were up there at least once a week working with Sam Honeycutt when she was a softball coach up there. Oh, I love Coach Honeycutt. She's been one of my favorite softball coaches to ever work with. Yes. My daughter thought the world of her. Uh, she taught her so much, and she helped her, you know, really blossom into a really good pitcher. That's awesome. Yeah, that's great. Now, I guess as I was reading through that and kind of studying you out, what made you leave Park with such success and come to Avila? Um, okay. So being at a small institution, uh, there is always a financial stability risk with institutions. Um, we're not big division one that has a ton of money coming in. And so, um, that was actually a, I did not voluntarily leave. That was an elimination of position due to budget cuts. Um, and that's actually the second time I've experienced that. And, um, I, I had been blessed actually when it happened the second time I actually got called back to the institution about two months later because they were like, uh, I had a, enough of an impact on my student athletes that they were like, uh, we need to get this guy back here. So I actually went back to uh, Avila university two months later. So now starting Avila from scratch, like the bio said, you were the first strength conditioning coach there. What did that take? I mean, I don't know what the facilities were. I don't know what you needed the university to invest in. How did that kind of get going for you? Yeah, I, I think that um, I, I tell a lot of my young strength coaches that are moving up that working at an NAI institution will probably make you one of the greatest strength coaches you can ever be. Um, you're not given a lot of resources. Um, you're not given large budgets. You have a ton of athletes that you're working with. Many of them are very novices, so you're not getting elite caliber and stuff like that. And so I, I remember in my interview process later on that uh, someone said the reason that I actually got selected over another candidate was I said it was going to be a three to five year process to establish the program and get it up and running. And the other person planned on coming in, just changing things over like crazy. And that kind of scared the coaches. So uh, that's something I learned um, at Park University. I reached out to Coach Bob Jones at William Woods University. Um, he's been a mentor of mine for decades now at this point and i remember one time i was in year three and he was like I, I called him up i was like i'm frustrated it's not going where i want you know things are just aren't clicking and he's like it takes three to five years to establish your program and then i remember the my fourth year the year that we won the national championship with volleyball i remember standing in the back of the weight room looking and all my seniors were teaching my freshmen how to do the lifts correctly and I'm like, I'm not even working technically right now. This is awesome. So to me, that was my first experience in establishing a program. And so I knew what to prepare or how to be prepared for that when I went to Avila. Um, and, and a lot of the same things happen. It's not that they don't have like facilities or equipment and stuff like that. Um, actually, both institutions I've worked at, the weight room has been there, which has actually been an issue because um, it was built without having the expertise of a professional to tell you, hey, you need this ceiling height. Hey, you need to not have this on the first or on the second floor. Hey, you need to consider using bumper plates instead of cast iron plates because it'll cause stress to the concrete underneath the rubber flooring. Stuff that we are taught even in our administration uh, coursework preparation for the exams, uh, a regular athletic director or a vice president doesn't doesn't have the background to be thinking about that. So 
in my case, it's always been uh, an uphill battle. Um, I, I don't consider it really a negative because once again, like I said, I think that I'm more versatile in training a wide variety, wild, a wide discipline. I can explain exactly what I want to my athletes. Um, I am lucky in that my first position at Avila before I was an athletic director, I was also a full-time faculty and I still get to teach one class a semester or two sometimes. And so my weight room is a lab for my kinesiology students. They actually get to uh, hear about something theoretically in class. And then I'm stopping them a day later going, remember when we discussed this in class here, is it physically happening right now? So that helps with buy-in a ton because um, my kinesiology students end up actually helping to sell that um, our program is what's best for the athletes because they understand that they're hearing from it in a classroom setting that it's based upon science and everything that I do has to be science-based. Now going into the NAIA setting on, on top of, you know, lower budgets. And like you talked about, you know, not all of your athletes are, are top tier. A lot of them are moving into that sport at a pretty young training age. Let's say you also have really big teams from what I've seen, you know, I know some of them softball and baseball teams can carry just a huge amount of kids and a lot of them will play JV and then hopefully be developmental. So your weight room could be packed full with just one team really quickly. How are you able to manage and navigate that? Is it now that you're set up, is it through your seniors or is it all you watching it? How do you do that? So for the first nine years professionally, I was always by myself. And yes, I leaned on my seniors. I still lean on my seniors because I want them to develop. And not even my seniors. I, I want those who want to step into a leadership position to have the opportunity to help educate, help mentor. Um, I was just talking to my softball uh, lifting group. The entire softball team was in there from 430 to 530. I said, upperclassmen, you know, I, I'm putting this on you. You have not done this step that needs to be done in educating them in this process. And I expect you to now step up and fulfill that. Um, three years ago, I did get my first full-time GA, um, coach Derek Woody, who is absolutely amazing. And, um, after two years, he did such a great job. He became a full-time position and I'm one of the few strength coaches in my conference that has a full-time assistant. So doing a whole bunch of GAs, which, I mean, I, I love the guy he's, he's made my life so much easier. Um, I would say first, what, what has made us successful with our numbers? One, we do not have a lot of JV. So we have about 500 athletes, which is still a ton. Um, we're not 800 and something at like fellow institutions that I know of out there. But in the end, also, I think that we have created a, we're, we're a department, even though there's only two of us, there's a system. Um, we program design within that system. So if he can't be at a training session, I can pull up his training session and I can identify exactly what phase of training they're in. Um, we all use the same exercises. We have our own database that we select from. They're categorized. And so therefore, I, I want the handoff of a team training with him to be equal to a handoff of them training with me. And he's so great. I fully expect after this year that he will probably move on professionally. And I hope he does. And then I can start on with the next person. But also when he leaves, if I take one of his teams, I have to be able to train it. And so they need to be able to see that there's continuity between her because we are one department, one program that's trying to develop them. Not this is my strength coach. This is the strength and conditioning department. I think that's huge. And finding somebody that, that works well with you and the athletes, sometimes that's not as easy as, as what you would think, I'm sure. Yeah, the story I will tell is that at, upon his graduation – uh, at the graduation ceremony, there was a couple of coaches that were receiving their master's degrees and other um, discipline also. And when his name got called, I, I think that he had the largest amount of, of students yell out his last name. And it was thunderous, in my opinion, in the auditorium. And I'm like, that shows someone that is impacting my uh, student athletes. And I mean, I'm going to I'm going to miss it when that guy leaves. He's one of my best friends. I mean, we have a great relationship outside of the university and just hanging out with the same likes. It, it could not have been a better person to find to work with. And he will be extremely difficult to ever replace. That's funny you say that. I know here at Adrian at the high school, the kids can pick the faculty that hands out their diploma. This would be very similar to what you're cool. saying. And I talked to a few of the teachers after it was over and I said that I thought their raise should be based on how many diplomas they handed out because yeah. there's, there are some exceptional teachers up there that are handing out 20 or 30 diplomas. And there's others that aren't handing out any, uh, I mean, maybe that 
relationship with the kids that some of those teachers are having is truly impactful. And, and that's our goal in the end is, you know, I mean, yes, I want my athletes to win games. I want, but I want them to become better adults. That's the word I use better adults. I don't want to make this a gender issue. And in the end, if we are helping them grow, if they've learned, if we're helping them learn from mistakes, then we've improved their lives overall. And so that's something that him and I both do, I think exceptionally well. Now I've heard you talk about this in some other, uh, podcast but making your athletes available where they're healthy and they're functional ranks above their performance so in creating a system like that where you have happy healthy athletes do you start with functional movement what what are you looking for to create that athlete that can hold up the stress of the sport yeah so um our general philosophy is stress is cumulative there's lots of different types of stress. This is the same message that I share to parents when they're bringing their students through and they're considering coming to Avila of uh, the story I tell is, you know, your student's going to have a bad day where they do bad on their exam. So they're going to come in, they're still going to lift, but on that day, we're not going to expect the exact same. You have to hit this percentage of lift. Since we use velocity based training, we do have the flexibility of you still can hit the right speed. You cause the right adaptation for that day, but you didn't overstress that body. You actually, kept a little bit back probably because of some type of cumulative fatigue in psychological, emotional, physical stress from practices, games, uh, any of those other variables, uh, homesickness, things like that. And so if the athlete is able to properly recover because we didn't overstress them, but they still got a good training session in, do we really need to, to hit that one, um, you know, 97% intensity or whatever variable that you want to associate with it? Uh, I think that we have moved to, we understand there is a cumulative effect overall. If an athlete, I've had athletes, I'll give a really great example. I had a football player that made the improper decision recently um, in regards to whether he was going to finish his workout. Um, and he left. Instead of calling him out next time he arrived, berating him and stuff like that, I brought him out. Uh, I talked to him on the side, which I think is huge. So I didn't call him out in front of his teammates. We had a conversation of um, what's going on. You know, there's always something behind what's that decision making. So let's peel the onion. Let's find out what's going on. Let's see if we can help them learn to make better decisions. The guy immediately was like, I'm sorry. That was a horrid decision. I will do better. Um, I am committed to this program, I had this great conversation. And I'm like, you know what, right there, we're done. I mean, I, I don't need to keep, you know, beating this kid down. He's a freshman. I did reinforce to him that I have a policy where if an athlete asks for a mental health day, I say, okay, what type of mental health day is this? Is this a day where, um, you've lost your, uh, grandfather or your grandfather like figure and you need to take out the aggression on the weights, but you don't need your strength coach to be riding you intensity wise. I've had that happen. Or is this a day that uh, I had a freshman last year, very homesick and she wouldn't admit it initially. And it had to get to the point. I'm like, am I going to have to tell your coach that I had to send you out of the weight room because of lack of effort? Or are you going to admit that there's something wrong without having to tell me what it is? She left. She came back. She's like, I'm homesick. Perfect. Done. Do you need to actually train today to help with that? Or do you need to go get mentally composed? And she's like, I need a day off. I gave her the day off. That person has been great ever since. And when she came back this year, she is training so hard this year. I can sacrifice a workout or two for the greater good of a year's worth of quality training because they know I care. They know I love them and they know that um, I am bought into what is best for them. And I'm not treating them like robots or like dogs. I, I want to treat them like a human being and I expect them to treat me like a human being. So the faster I can get to where that understanding is, the same thing with that football player from um, on the Sunday's lift that we had. It, it was a great experience. And I probably won that guy over for the next four years of his life just because I gave him a little bit of grace. And I understood that, you know what, sometimes people need to learn from their mistakes and we don't necessarily need to, you know, destroy them in physical th discipline or, you know, suspensions or anything like that. Treat them like a human being. and You'll probably get way more out of that. And you're dealing with a, a very young adult. And a lot of them, this is a huge transitional phase in their life. And I'm sure some of the emotions and feelings are pretty difficult to process. So I, having you there and at least taking the time to figure out what is wrong, they know they have somebody they can trust. 
And the beauty is, I would say at this point, you know, this is my 10th year I'm going into Avila. I've had enough people come back that trained with me before when I will admit I was not even as good as what I am now at fostering this environment. And they still want to come back and see me. I want every one of them, because I don't plan on leaving Avila, I want every one of them to come back, you know, 10, 20 years from now and be looking for me because they're like, you helped me on this one day. And I never forgot that. That's what it's really about. I want them to have a connection to the institution through me because they enjoy their experience so much. And sometimes it just doesn't take as much effort as a person may think. Just a small gesture of kindness when somebody's really down may be enough to totally turn that person around. Literally as simple as just listening to them. I mean, I, and I've heard the gambit of, you know, my, my brother was just shot back at home and he didn't make it. My, uh, I walked in on my, my mom's boyfriend who was dead. I mean, the, the amount of trauma that these students are going through that, and, and on the male side, it does seem to be significantly higher. Um, it, it's shocking. And, and for me, I'm like, I, I can't even empathize with that. I can't even wrap my head around it, but at least I'm giving them someone to talk to, or maybe even give a hug. And I repeatedly tell them all the time outside of the training session or how much I love them. I want them to know that I love them. I want them to know that I care and that I'm one of the people that they can hopefully come to and share when they need to. And it doesn't have to be detailed. I don't need to know everything. I just need to know that you need, you need help today. Let's find you that help. Let's move you past this so that you are in a better position later on. So we've kind of touched on it a little bit. Some questions I had, the psychology of working with athletes. I know you're into proactive coaching and a leadership council, uh, helping athletes kind of set something up where, where they can police and control maybe the culture to a certain extent. How are you able to get all that going and get the coaches buy in and get the athletes buy in and make that work? So um, what's interesting, um, the one that we really adopted hard and it's really worked well was – I did um, some online training. Well, first I heard of Dr. Rick McGuire out of Mizzou. Uh, he was a psychology professor and also a track coach for a couple of decades at Mizzou. And he helped found the, uh, the Institute of Positive Coaching. I heard him speak at one of his last lectures at a CSCCA national conference. Uh, you know, when he's done with his lecture and you saw the people that were up on stage, like Kaz Kazadi and Pat Ivey and... Uh, and I'm forgetting everybody. Uh, Bird was up there. I mean, it, the, the, the amount of people that were up on that stage, I was like, those are some heavy hitting people. And this is the guy that taught them how to build relationships. So he was nice enough um, to provide everybody who attended his presentation access to the online coaching um, in Institute of Positive Coaching. And I was like, I fell in love. And so I started reading more into it. Um, I, I created a, a weekly meeting where my volleyball coach was there, my baseball coach, the women's basketball coach, the GA for softball. You know, uh, we were all coming in and doing this online training together and discussing through it so that it was a shift, hopefully, in departmental standards. And then on top of it, our brand new football coach did his master's degree in positive coaching from Mizzou. So it, it was this beautiful, like, alignment of the stars that when I wanted to really roll this out heavily in, um, in the spring, I was allowed to because he bought in from the football side. That's a huge help. All these other coaches love the ideas of it. And the, the, the thing that we really honed in on hard for us was they talk about the five C's within success. So up on our, um, on one of our, uh, parts of our wall right there in the middle of the weight room is the word success spelled with seven C's in the middle. And there are five C's inside of it. Those five C's are the things that you can control. And we want to teach them. These are the things that we want you to always be working on so that you are working on your, um, your confidence, your concentration, your composure, your commitment. And I knew I always, when I have to list these off, I always have a challenge with this, uh, concentration, confidence, composure, commitment, and I knew I needed to look this up ahead of time and I'm already, uh, I'll bring it back. Cause I know I'm going to find it once I, once I, cause what we do is when our athletes have a problem with any of those five C's, we point it out right there at the moment, say, which one are you not exhibiting? And, and I'm willing to go as far as um, we have to model these behaviors. And um, I've 
been a hothead strength coach. I, I was in the army. You know, I mean, I, I know how to be the drill sergeant. My C is composure. And there are other C's that are specific to each individual person. And so when they have an issue, I'm reminding them, hey, which C are you not working on right now? Which one do I want you to automatically adjust? They've heard uh, courage. There was the other one. I knew I'd come around to it. So like on courage, did you have the courage to admit that you did something wrong? Um, both in the last two cases of the two football players that when I addressed them directly, they were like, uh, one of them came up to me. And as soon as he barely even got out an apology, I stopped him right there. I was like, and you're done. We're great. I just wanted to see you take that step, have the courage to admit that you are wrong and we're already great and moving on. I want to see that. I want to see that, uh, you know, I I've heard players say, well, the coach took my confidence from me. These things are the things that you can control. You can't um, have someone take your confidence. You can allow them to take your confidence, which is you once again, giving it up. So can you maintain that confidence? If we're getting ready to do for some reason, I don't know why, I have a ton of females that can't get past a 95 pound hand clean because of confidence issues. And we will groove that exercise nonstop until they finally get it. And then boom, they break that. And now they're at 115, 125 and they're flying because they had a mental block. There's confidence. Um, concentration. You know, are you having side conversations in the weight room? Are you more worried about what music is playing in the weight room than, you know, and, and, and any of these like concentration, we can then tie that back to what's happening on the field. What is your game prep like? What is the actual situations in the game? Did you focus on your concentration? Composure is mine. That's the one that I have to con continuously work on. And I tell them that and I might even be getting a little uh, uh, upset about what they're doing, their lack of concentration. And I'll tell them, I am working on my composure right now. And if I can work on my composure, then you can work on this. That one was one of the biggest win overs when another football player came to me and said, Coach C, I'm having issues with one of my coaches, but because you have been demonstrating composure, I wanted to demonstrate composure. How do I handle this situation? I was like, oh my gosh, this works. It was amazing. Um, commitment, we've had issues. You know, we've had a lot of people that leave, coaches leave. You know, what is your commitment to this program and actually? Are you committed enough to put in the hard work to actually stick with this process? Or are you expecting it to be easy? If we can constantly hit those things, we're probably going to turn out, you know, directly from the Institute, successful people. And so by doing that, it's a really simple system of just re-educating them always, all the time. And I don't tell the coaches that they have to do it. The answer is you're going to hold me to these standards and I'm going to model these behaviors. So therefore you have to therefore hold these standards also. And by doing that, I turn out great positive athletes to my coaches that hopefully are carrying that stuff into competition and therefore we're running smoothly. So then they're always appreciative of it also. Now going through this and working your athletes through it, developing this mindset and a leader leadership council, I'm sure all of us can think of a time where we've worked somewhere or been a part of something where it was really great just to talk about it. Nothing ever really went into action. It was just a plan to make people feel better about what was happening. Kids see through that stuff really quickly. So how do they have a little bit of control or a little bit of say where they feel like they are being impactful and it's just not rhetoric or propaganda that, the, that you or the school is pushing on them? Yeah, so the good part is, is that it is coming from me, not the institution. Um, but a good example is, one, I, I'd never seen this. I loved it. My new football coach had the captains or the people who want to be captains, they interviewed for the position. They dressed up for the position, just like a job interview, because that's how serious this is. So this was not a voting on process. This was, you really want this, you got to prove it. We ended up having three defensive players and one offensive player. So it wasn't even like a good 50-50 split between it. These were the people that the coaches thought were the most valuable to those positions. So then if I'm having an issue with a specific player, instead of me making the decision, I go directly to the athlete, uh, to the coach or to the the captain. The good example is the one that I had to talk to, and I said, "Hey, this is the story of what happened. Now, when I go talk to him, what do you want to happen? If he apologizes directly, do we want to let this go and we're okay with it, or?" Do we want there to be a disciplinary measure associated with it? What do you want? Now I'm giving them the power or the ownership of the decision-making process with this. 
Um, we had an issue that, that once again, the, on the defensive side, I had an issue where uh, an athlete, sorry, he left some gum in the weight room and it just infuriated me on the back of my rack. And I mean, I was definitely not in composure. Thank goodness. I, I called up my defensive uh, captain said, I want you to find who this is. We, he needs to understand what he did. We need an apology and then we'll make the, the decision. That athlete owned it within 10 minutes of the message going out to the group because they weren't sure who did it. Well, that's what, that's a win right there because he's showing courage to admit that he was wrong. And so by doing that, and once again, letting the captain handle it, there's the captain learning to be in a leadership position. And now I'm backing the captain's decision on what they want to do. If, if that captain says, you know what, if they apologize and they're sincere, we need to let this go. Well, then that's the team's decision. And I need to honor that. Now, in the more modern era of athletes, as you're getting younger athletes in, with the way sports have changed, now I heard you on 810 and you were talking about giving up officiating and dealing with parents and, and competitive sports and stuff like that. Are you seeing a different athlete that maybe doesn't carry those traits and they have to be taught? Or are a lot of your guys coming in ready for that? Yeah. So um, interesting on a side note, because things always change over time. I'm actually back into officiating. Um, the reason why is my daughter uh, wanted to start officiating. So she's a provisional soccer ref. And I was like, one day I want to ref with my 12 year old when she turns 13, becomes a full ref. So I actually got back into it. Um, I've been selective in where I've been officiating because I'm going to work with places where the associations are either uh, are highly supportive of the officials. And one of those associations, they know that I'm actually there not just to officiate, but I'm there to actually educate the next um, set of refs so that they feel empowered, so that they are not being belittled, so they're not being overly questioned by parents that, sorry, they don't understand the rules, um, and teaching them how to manage the game. What I see as the greatest challenge, uh, specifically um, on my female side, I've noticed that my females – um, are expected to be perfect too much. And I'm seeing excessive burnout where my females are quitting their sport halfway through their collegiate career because it's not an enjoyable experience anymore. That is the most, uh, that's the saddest thing I've ever seen. This is the reason that we want them in sports. This is the reason we don't want parents yelling at this from the sidelines because the answer is this is supposed to be fun for the kids. And no, the majority of you, your kids are not going to college. And I educate people all the time. What is the entire scholarship model of a private institution? How does it work versus a public? Because I want them to stop wasting tons of money on competitive club travel, AAU sports, and leave them in rec and let them have fun in rec for a lot longer. Um, my, my oldest was forced out of rec because her team collapsed and she didn't want to start over and she had the opportunity to at least play with people she knew and competitive. I think she left too early. That, that was her choice. Um, I supported her choice, but I, I think that the females are overly, the, the perfection that's placed on them in softball, in volleyball, in, in basketball is horrid. Uh, I think that the the lack of education of the sport, we're teaching them skills, 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 and we're not teaching them how to understand the game so that they can learn to make decisions about strategic aspects of the game. I think that that's poor. Um, that's probably, it's a combination of one of two things. This is now onto the men's side, but you've got give the ball to the best player and let them go score because I want to win more games so that I can get to a higher level so that I can charge the parents more per month to be able to coach. The entire system is so broken. It's a pay for play system. I can't stand it. So you've got these overly or the early developers are getting over burnout. The, uh, the late bloomers are most likely quitting because it's not an enjoyable experience and they're not sticking with it. And the ones that do are probably burnt out at the end because they were too worried about perfectionism and stuff like that. And then there's the entire, there's no longer even helicopter parenting. There's what I, uh, I I'm stealing the term lawnmower parenting, which is this, removing all obstacles from in front of the child so that their life is easy. And I'm a hundred percent against that. If you ask either one of my daughters, they'll tell you what is daddy's job. And daddy's job is to push you to challenge you. Now, when they fail and I want them to fail, I want to be there to pick them back up, educate them on what they could do better next time. But my job is not to make it too easy for them. My job is to challenge them 
so that they grow as a better person. So now the same message that I'm doing with my 18 year olds is the same message I use with my 12 year old. And I'm telling my 18 year olds, if I'm willing to do this with my 12 year old daughter, I'm definitely willing to do it with you. So you better get on board with this process. You just answered a ton of questions I'd had in that, in that whole thing. So I'll try to, I'll try to grab them and kind of pull them out a little bit and maybe sure. we can elaborate on them. But uh, burnout was one of them. I've seen a lot of kids, you know, my daughter played competitive softball, I've seen a lot of kids go through it, you know, good athletes that just finally had enough. I think when she stepped off the field the last time, she was ready to be done. Mm -hmm. Is is there anything you can do as a coach to try to help some of them athletes as they get there, fight through burnout, find the joy of being a part of a team, kind of get them back on track where they feel the love of the sport again? So for me, with my experience at the collegiate level, when they've made that decision, they're done. Um, I, I can't fix it at that point. I've, I've only got the max for usually four years. So I don't, by the time they realize it, it's usually their sophomore year, maybe their freshman. I've seen juniors quit. Um, and so at that point, I can't fix it. Do I think at the younger levels it can be fixed? Yeah. Uh, you know, my daughter's number one goal when we had to switch clubs because her club was collapsing this year in soccer was I want to play with friends. So we intentionally were trying to recruit teams or players from the old team. Hey, come to this tryout. See if you like this team with us. And the good part is she's got like five people on her present new team that she already knows because soccer, I think, is a great example. Soccer used to be based upon age or um, academic year. So just like softball, all the second graders, all the third graders. And then soccer went and switched it and made it to where it's based upon your birth year. And so now you know, her, one of her best friends when she was younger couldn't play with her unless her younger friend, her uh, friend played up because there was a two months difference. She was born in February. My daughter was born in December. So you've got these organizations that are not doing what is best for the child. Once again, because we're so worried about um, trying to get to that next level, this entire fear of missing out and all these extra clinics. And I'm sorry, you know, I, I'm trying not to be mean to people that are making a living on this, but you're literally creating fear so that the parents will pay for extra stuff because you need to make a, a job a, a commission you know you need to support your family well i understand that is that really ethically what is best um I, I remember the one time i had to tell the coach that my daughter would not play winter soccer she almost burned out and we were trying to save her and keep her in soccer thank goodness we did that and she actually came back and liked the experience and now it's her favorite sport i try to keep her as a multi-sport athlete as long as i could but ironically, there were uh, things that happened along the way where coaches ruined experiences for her. And it's like, she doesn't want to do that sport. She doesn't want to do this sport. Even though I tried exposing her to them because I wanted her to have this huge library of efficient movement patterns and stuff like that, and not getting over usage injuries. But the culture around it, literally, I was fighting my own culture uh, of trying to help my daughter stay diversified. So in that case, yeah, she specifically is a soccer player. We, you know, we talk about all the time, are you, you know, is this too much? Should we worry about this? You know, do you want, do you really want to do this extra camp? I mean, most of these extra camps that are out there, I'm like, you're telling me that you're going to help my kid become so much better in four one hour sessions at a hundred dollars. No, because I know that when I'm training athletes, I'm talking about a four year quadrennial cycle. I know that you can't do that much with one session a week. You just can't, not enough for it to stick. And, and, and I go to, even when we are teaching sprint mechanics at the collegiate level, how many sprints do they really have to do for that to really stay in their head and show up on a field of play? I remember at park, our starting catcher, she had, I think she was on first base. There was a hit and you know we've been working on knee driving mechanics and stuff like that i'm sitting over on the dugout she rounds second she gets a third and she's like coach see did you see my high knee mechanics and i'm like that's awesome that i actually had one athlete in my 15 years actually pay attention to it when a ball's in play most of the time they don't so i would rather see this beautiful foundation of movement i love you know, both my daughters did gymnastics at an early age um the the youngest one stayed with it all the way through level three and i was like man, three, three hour sessions a week, that's nine hours. Uh, that's not acceptable. I know that's too much. She, you know, eventually I wouldn't say she burned out, but she learned, I don't like doing a lot of this parts of gymnastics. I really just like tumbling. So we were able to offset that and put her into tumbling classes and that made it more enjoyable for her. And therefore my goal of doing activity is how can I make this enjoyable and help you stick with it? 
am I blessed in that I work for an institution and I'm not chasing college scholarship money and stuff like that because I have certain opportunities that my child will be available to them? Yes. But also, if you look at the total amount of money that you probably spent in competitive sports and totaled it all up, that's what you probably should have put into your whatever state um, college tax-free savings account. And if you'd save that all up, they'd probably go into Mizzou for free by the time you're over. So did you really use that money wisely? Can I argue that they need to be with friends and all that? Yes, but your friends are now the sport group, which are different than your high school, than your school friends or your neighborhood friends. And once again, maybe we're just putting too much on all of them and we should just sit back and, and enjoy, watch the game. And uh, once again, be a spectator, just spectate. You don't need to be involved in this. That's the coach's job. I think COVID helped my daughter. I think she was on the edge of burning out that taking that year off when everything shut down, really give her a different perspective, give her some time to kind of miss it. They're, they're there all the time. We're working on it all the time. Sometimes that step back's really good. It seemed like we didn't know it at the time, but looking back on how things worked out, I, I think it actually helped. And I think like in my oldest daughter's case, cause I've done a lot of molding of my oldest daughter, you know, I we have a kind of a we agree goal that her goal is she wants to play competitive soccer to get to where she can play high school. We're not talking about ECNL or anything like that. She wants to play for her school and represent her school. I'm like, that's a really good thing. And then suddenly she blindsides me and she's like, I want to play college soccer. I'm like, I didn't say anything about playing college soccer. I would rather you just go to school and get your degree. So, you know, therefore she's making those decisions, which I think is, is a positive and I'm not hopefully influencing that. And that's something I'm always watching. If, what am I actually saying that could be influencing her one way or the other in her long-term decision-making? And you talked about athletes learning to strategize and really understanding the game. As much as they're playing, the kids I was around, they didn't truly understand the game they were playing, the ins and outs, what you're trying to do as a coach – I felt like we always tried to stress that, our game plan, and I wanted to get to a point where the girls just coached themselves and we were just there to offer suggestion. Mm -hmm. I think at certain times we got that, at certain times we didn't. But are you seeing an improvement in athletes by doing all this, or are you seeing an athlete that's actually behind? Um, I mean, so a lot of this is like me listening to my coaches talk too. Like I remember our old women's basketball coach saying our, our women's basketball team's IQ was so poor because once again, they were learning to, you know, to one V one or just pull the three. There was no strategy about what, I, here's a great example. I don't know why my men's basketball team asked me this question, but they were discussing, uh, one was like, coach, see, if I come at you and I cross you over, what are you doing? And I'm sitting going, I don't play basketball. I'm a soccer person. But I said, well, honestly, if I was soccer, this is what I would do, which is I'm not going to play you squared up. I'm actually going to step to the side and give you an angle because I know you're going to take that angle, and therefore I have eliminated the some of the decision-making that I have to do reactive-wise because I have guided you into an area that I want. Maybe strategically we taught our defense to therefore be secondary help so that as you're going, I'm actually guiding you into another defender. And this is, once again, this is strategy behind it. I love tactics. I love tactics of soccer. I love that my women's soccer coach is like, did you watch the game? Because let's talk tactics about what happened in our game. And that made me feel so good that she respected me enough to actually want to hear my input on how we play or what am I seeing. But I think that one thing I see or I hear coaches sometimes do this. I love it. Um, my daughter's present coach will say, but, you know, the ball's at their feet. And they're like, what do you see? It's not do this, or as one of my coaches said, it's not joystick controlling the game. It is teaching them to make decisions. But also, you know, there's a give and take here of, is the athlete spending the time watching games to get a better understanding? Uh, Women's World Cup and Men's World, um, in the Men's men's World Cup last year, Women's World Cup, there were some good tournaments for the U.S. team on the men's side. Both my daughters started watching games with me, and my oldest has been doing this for about a year and a half. And we'll talk about, okay, uh, something just happened. Good, let's rewind. Let's watch off the ball movement. What did this person do well? What did this person not do well? Where is the passing? Where is the open space? And so I'm trying to teach her to grasp these concepts, and I hope one day they'll click and automatically show up for her in a game. 
But once again, they're asking to watch the games with me. My youngest does it because it's it's a social thing that she sees me doing with her sister, and so she wants in on it. Great. Then you get to be a part of the process also of just watching sport together. Uh, I remember the game was on last night, and it was Dallas versus the um, the Giants. My my youngest is like, who do you want to win, Daddy? I was like, I don't care. I just want to watch a good game of football. I I I just I'm at the point now where I want to enjoy watching sport and not necessarily have to be about who wins or loses. That's what I want to see. And it seems to me, kind of talking about that, the strategy and everything that goes into the game, that a lot of these athletes go on to coach. Well, they never really learned the game. They were just a really good athlete. And the school's like, well, you were a good athlete. You'll be a good coach. Well, sometimes that education's not there, and it's a pretty rough process to gain it especially if yeah, you're coaching against coaches that know there, there's a joke that, you know, if they have an accent that they're going to be a good soccer coach um, in the United States, obviously. Um, because, and you're right. It, it's uh, the, those who can't play coach. I'm like, I think there's a lot of people who actually can't coach is, is the key. And, and I'm, I'm once again, I'm willing to own this process and have the courage to say, I have been a horrid strength coach before. I mean, I would, there are things that I'm embarrassed about that I've done. There are things where I would love to talk to. Um, his name is Lopez, and he's somewhere over in deployed in the military. Now I'm like, if I could find that guy again, I would apologize to him directly. I'm like, you know what? That warm up was not that important, and I don't know why I was so wanting it to be perfect because I wanted this regiment system. And the answer is uh, that that wasn't what mattered. That wasn't a priority. And now my priorities have changed. And I can recognize that. So I think that there's a lot of people who are not good coaches. I see it as an official, the amount of yelling. I'm like, why are you yelling so much? Uh, I, I have a D license. So I have the lowest level national soccer license. When I took that course, they said during a match, you take notes, you make an adjustment, and then you take more notes. And then whatever those notes are, that's what you work on the next practice. You don't make in-game coaching because it's already too late you should have worked on that at practice i love that philosophy i think that's a great idea go look at the big picture see how your team's playing you know yeah there's some critical times you could but coaches need to feel either that they're being validated by because of how much they're charging and the parents want to see that they're actively coaching or because of their own ego they gotta be like i'm helping to control this game soccer is easy soccer is a fluid game my job is to not call fouls unless it interferes with the game if there's a foul sweet we're still playing until i determined that there was no advantage i love the fluidity of soccer that enables me as the referee to try to keep the game going and not stop it until there's a violation of that has to happen obviously other sports don't have that and yes culture of you know of uh, football is you know there are plays we have to run our plays we have to know the play you know look at peyton manning and and how much the answer was peyton manning was making decisions in game and he was allowed or allowed to dictate a lot of that you had tom brady educating offensive players and everything that patrick mahomes does with being able to read plays not including all of the uniqueness that he brings as being a baseball uh, player and being able to throw in unusual positions these guys are people that are uh, being allowed a great example is coach reed is giving um uh, patrick mahomes the flexibility to lead the team the way he wants. As long as it's within the boundaries of what Coach Reed establishes, why not empower them to make that decision? And so I love to see empowerment-based coaching on the field of play, or specifically now that's my goal in the weight room, is once again, this is your team. I don't even break my teams down. I don't run them out on the field. The answer is you're the ones that are out there winning. And I'll tell them, you know, I there's so many times where it's funny where they're doing a velocity-based lift, and I come and I stand next to the rack, and suddenly they're getting – at least a third of a meter per second faster. I'm like, why is it I have to come stand next to you to get you to lift faster? You have to want this. I can't run out in the middle of the field and pump you up and get you jacked. The answer is this is internal. You have to find this on your own. So you, if you can display it in the weight room, you'll probably show it in the field. If you're having trouble in the weight room, we have a problem of probably how you're going to act on the field also. And so I'm trying to remind them of you win those games. I love that my coaches, because this is the only little glory I get, is I love all my little conference championship or national championship rings. But I don't ever want to be a part of the ceremony even because I want you to hand it to me on the side. I want to put it in my display case. 
I want to bring home, show to my family, say, look what I got. But past that, this is about you. This is not about me. Um, Oh, what's his name? He's at the University of Oregon, Radcliffe, Coach Radcliffe. There's a beautiful picture of Coach Radcliffe. And Oregon has won something huge, confetti, green, yellow coming down. He is a good 30 yards away with his hands on his hips, watching people celebrate because the answer is, I just gave you a guidance. I give you a map. You're the one that did all the work. And I, I love that picture of him. I show it in my class all the time. I talk about it in the weight room of my job is to give you a roadmap. Your job is you put in the work. You're the one that's going to earn this process. And thanks for letting me be a part of the ride. And that's a, a pretty unique way of looking at that. Hopefully, as I matured when I was coaching, that I finally got to that point. Like you said, everybody looks back on some things they did and was like, man, I don't even want to be associated with that version of me. But, you know, as we were coming up and coming through and coaching, I coached with my brother a lot, and he found out really quick, if you can break the other coach down, you win. It has nothing to do with the players they have. They could have a way better team than you, but if you can do a couple little things and that coach loses his composure, you're going to win just because he's going to break his own girls down or she. So learning how to stay composed on your side and watch the madness happen, happen on the other seemed to be a pretty good technique. Mm -hmm. And we, we go as far as that with teaching them once again, composure. Um, let's say they're doing something on their velocity based training and the app crashes. This is something I teach in orientation all the time. I'm like, Okay, so the app crashes. What happens when an official makes a call that you perceive as a bad call? Because I'm not going to say it's a bad call. Most likely it was actually a good call. And I, I'll get some of the answers of, well, I yell at him or I complain about it. I'm like, no, the answer is you move on. You maintain your composure and you move on because you are letting some most likely insignificant decision making process uh, affect how you view the game because now everybody's against you. Or I've been, I've been told that, uh, I'm a homer ref. I'm like, I don't care who wins this match for anything. So why is this a concern for me? I got to go home and see my kids. You're, you know, that you're an Omaha team and you're a Kansas team. I live in Missouri. I don't care about either one of your states. So in the end, if, if we are ensuring that those athletes are maintaining that composure and learning, once again, that skill to just brush that, sh brush that off their shoulder, then we can practice that in the weight room and then Remind them that this is how you need to act in a competition or going as far as I'll go extreme. I'll tell them, go up to the referee and ask them what they do for their real job. Because most referees, full-time refereeing is not their primary job. It's a side gig. They usually want to contribute back. They love being around the game. Um, I like, honestly, the time commitment of the flexibility. Of, I can ref a game or I cannot ref a game versus if I'm coaching on a team, I'm consistently always with that team. So if that's an issue for me, then I want to be able to say that I'm a part of it, but also I have a full-time job. I've had people be like, you know, this is your power trip. I'm like, my power trip, if anything, would be being an assistant athletic director at a university, not whether I do something in a game or not. So for me, it's one of those, I want them to realize that the referee is another human being. Just like we've been talking about, um, I want to treat you like a human being in the weight room so that you treat me like a human being in the weight room. We're going to treat the officials like a, like a human being. We're going to treat our coaches our parents, our significant others. And now this starts to permeate to, once again, we have developed a probably a better adult. Now to move away from that a little bit and get into some of the things you do, I had listened to you talk about moving into triphasic. Mm -hmm. How did that work out for you and how were you able to implement that? Or is that a path you're still down? Oh, we are definitely still on it and my athletes hate it. Um, <laughs> So what we do with it, um, I got to hear Coach uh, Caldea speak at whatever conference. I get confused between the conferences so much I go to. And he was doing an, a pre-lecture. And my understanding from stuff I read, it was, you know, it was in three-week chunks. And, you know, you do your eccentric and then your isometric and your concentric phase. And whatever he said, I realized, my gosh, I'm already doing the concentric phase with our power phase, which we do a concentrated four-week block summated whatever you want to call it where our goal is to teach neurologically to move faster that's our goal so we do that for four weeks well there's the concentric phase that's done i don't have to do necessarily french contrast or anything like that we're already doing explosive based stuff then all we had to do is go you know what we don't really need to do three weeks we can do two weeks because this was something he'd said and he's like you have the flexibility to do that we did two weeks of of eccentric and then two weeks of isometric the only thing that we are not doing 
Um, and it is a restriction of equipment, to be fair. He's got, you know, he's working with Division One Olympic level hockey players. I am not in any of my athletes. So he's got some flexibility there. He has a much smaller staff. Um, his Supra Max weights that he's using 120%, 120%, I don't do that. But what's amazing is you bring in a freshman, and right now we're early in on this process. We're doing the high repage stuff. We're just grooving the whole uh, the techniques, stuff like that, no heavy loads. Here in about a week, many of our sports are going to switch over their first two weeks of eccentric cycle. And watching the muscular co-contraction of a knee on a split stance squat and their entire body shaking as they're trying to decelerate is, is so huge. And then by the time... We get through that, and then we do an isometric, and they hate the isometric phase. We're still coaching up the explosiveness. Then we go to concentric. We come back. We've gone through eight weeks of training, maybe 10 weeks of training. They go back. They do that eccentric again, and everything is smooth. I have taught them to stabilize and control their body. I have taught them to decelerate. Now we're going back to number one goal for me is to give coach their starting players as long as possible durability of the athlete is most important. I don't care uh, about performance first, and I don't really truly believe that you can in, uh, prevent injuries. You might be able to reduce an injury. An ankle sprain might be a level one ankle sprain versus a, le a level three because they were able to control their ankle a little bit better. Okay, fine. But in the end, if the coach has their starting 11, starting five, starting uh, six volleyball players, nine, any of that, they're probably going to be happier with the results. I learned that all the way back from Coach Kronk at Avila said, if you can take my starting shortstop and not have him pull his groin this year, you can do whatever you want. And for the next five years, I got to do whatever I want because he never pulled his groin again. I gave him his starting players, the ones that he has recruited as the most valuable. I, I gave it to him on a consistent basis as well as I can. Then we try to, you know, once again, reduce injury. Then we're talking about athletic performance as our third goal. That's pretty far down the list versus a lot of people. But that's because in the end, how much correlation do what we do in the weight room really transfer over to what's happening on the field? And we can debate that all out. You know, is it vector specific and, and are you producing forces in the right ranges and at the right speeds? And are you doing bilateral multiplanar? Oh my gosh, we can get into the excessive details of all of this in the end. Um, I can't validate that my program technically helps someone win more than another. I think that was coach Vermeil who said that he won an NBA championship and an NFL championship. And he said, I can't, prove that my program helped us win those championships any more than any other program out there. So now, okay, maybe it is once again, the culture thing, or it is the durability of the starting 11. You know, I, I see so many uh, great athletes that they're just not durable. They just break a lot. And, and you see that I think in the division one, you got a ton of talented players that they just physically can't hold up. Their bodies aren't mechanically set up to handle the high intensity of the sport. Can we offset that? I'll hopefully some, that would be my number one goal because that's going to that I, I'm not, the beauty is I'm not held to the, the management of my coaches. They don't have an, a, a direct line of me being hired, fired or anything like that. I'm autonomous as an NAI institution and that's awesome. But in the end, I still want my coaches to be happy. And I have in many ways, you know, created where I build a great relationship with one coach and that coach is good friends with another coach. And suddenly my relationship with the other coach is dynamically proving because I put the time in with the first coach. I was sharing that with one of my um, brand new, the new defensive line coach who's, you know, moving his way through the process of getting into full-time positions. I said, walk the hallway, talk to the coaches, anything not related to their sport, you know, ask them about, Oh, uh, how's home in Nebraska? Uh, how is, how's your daughter's dance studio moving along? Build relationships with your coaches to where, they trust you to do what's best, and they're probably going to dictate less of what you can do, which means I can actually do what I know is more scientifically proven anyways, and I don't have coaches saying, oh, you can't do this specific exercise or that specific exercise because they trust me, and they know that over time I have given them good product. Now, talking about Cal Dietz, do you get into his ankle and foot rocker, especially dealing with a lot of soccer players? Do you do all the foot development that he does? Uh, so what we do, um, so I do not get into um, an excessive amount of that. And I've seen, you know, a lot of what he does with what uh, reflective performance reset. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious, I'm like, man, do I, re but also I know some of the people are like, they personally don't think it's a rabbit hole. That's positive. I, I just haven't pulled the trigger on that. My assistant's even been through level one training. Um, we don't implement that. 
what we specifically do that is really unique, and I think it's funny now seeing so many social media posts, is uh, we lift barefoot. And we have lifted barefoot for a decade in my weight room at Avila University. Uh, I remember our old defensive line coach, he'd walk somebody in and be like, okay, the first thing that's going to be weird is they're all barefoot. And I'll talk to my orientation group. I'm like, I'll make you a deal. You can drop a 45-pound plate on my bare foot if I get to drop a 45-pound plate on your foot in your shoe and it not cause an injury. And they realize, okay, uh, you know, our, our bumper plates, the, the length of the bar is outside of the actual rack footprint. That weight's not going to run into you. So in the end, I'm trying to teach them. I, I can mechanically see, and I think I am pretty good at biomechanics. I can see where they are in pronation or most of the time it's almost always excessive pronation. How is that affecting their knee movement pa pattern, their lack of mobility in their hips? And because I can see their weight shifting forward or their weight shifting in or any of these, I can directly cue them up. Now I'm not having to do functional movement screens because our training is our screening and or better phrase, our testing is our training and our training is our testing because I'm constantly making those manipulations as we go through this process instead of spending time doing all this testing. And I find that my athletes do better on that. Now, one of the things I'm noticing the most is, is the turf toe issue is seems to be a pretty decent amount. And most of them, uh, I remember I was talking to a pitcher. I said, you know, what type of shoe do you wear most of the time? He's like, I wear Birkenstocks. And now we're talking about putting our toe in excessive flexion all the time, trying to keep the shoe on because it has no heel strap. Even my own eight-year-old daughter noticed this recently. She was like, when I go on walks with mommy, my feet hurt later. I'm like, it's because you're wearing sandals. Let's get you a shoe, a, you know, some type of sandal that has a heel strap. Suddenly she's fine. These are simple biomechanical truths of how our body moves. So I can cue that stuff up during the lift session without putting extra work in. Because going back to the organization of everything related to 500 athletes, I usually see my athletes no more than four times a week for an hour that's 168 hours that they can mess up or 112 waking hours that they can mess stuff up and i'm only seeing them four days a week i have to get the greatest bang for my buck so i'm not doing a lot of extra work outside of what i found to be the most tried and true that i know is going to get me where i need to get you know it's i need the best return on investment on whatever we're training now moving into vbt I know you started doing that maybe a few years ago from the podcast I was listening to and trying to move it into modern time. What have you seen has been your biggest benefit of moving to that style training? Yeah. Um, one, the athletes just love the almost the uh, man. Wow. How, there's so many, I learned you a, an actual, I've done an hour long presentation on how to implement velocity based training at the Missouri and Kansas clinics. And, um, one of the things that I find most interesting, it's the gamification of the lift, meaning, um, you know, literally, are you trying to beat your previous speed? Same weight, every single rep, are you trying to make it faster? It has helped us that we have focused on really overcoaching that concentric phase. No matter if it's an eccentric, isometric, or a regular movement, are we overcoaching this intent of bar speed? I, I was talking to an athlete who... Um, I know that she uh, that she trains with her father during the summer, and it, you know the girl puts in work, no doubt about that. She is huge muscular wise. She does, a, but I know also that she's not training at the right speed. So today we are bench pressing, and she's like, I can bench press a hundred and I think she said one hundred and fifteen pounds. Today she couldn't move seventy five pounds at the correct bar speed of 0. 0.5 meters per second. That's not even fast. That's a moderate weight, moderate speed, and we talked about. You know, has your training been actually with the intent of being explosive like you're going to be on the field or have you been teaching or have you been learning how to do controlled, you know, muscle activation, thinking about the that's not our goal. We are training for athleticism, not training for bodybuilding. And so it has helped us from a recruiting standpoint. One, we're one of the few institutions in our area. And I mean, old conference and new conference that are really implementing velocity based training. Uh, on a on a healthy scale, meaning all the time, um, it is it has helped with that. It's helped with accountability uh, as simple as I have up to forty eight athletes in the weight room. It's an easy way to count reps. I know that you did your reps because I see it right there on your workouts. And I've had to call people out when I know they are not doing it. And going back to that accountability thing, I had a basketball issue a couple of years ago where I knew three guys didn't do their all their sets. I gave them the opportunity to admit to it, have the courage. Two of them did, one didn't. So I was like, man, you're really not going to do this? You're not going to admit to it? 
He didn't, so we pulled it up on the screen for everyone to see. This person is the one cutting reps. This is not a good thing. They are not committed to our program, and now we're hitting all those C words again. And, I mean, to be fair, that guy never lasted, um, even though it was his senior year, uh, because of his lack of commitment. And you can see it throughout the years. I had data to prove it. And I think saying that we are a data-driven program, allowing velocity-based training to allow us to auto-regulate our weights based upon the total cumulative stress that's on your body, um, all of those factors, on top of simple factors like, yes, I think our cleans have dramatically improved. Are we chasing, you know, 325 pound cleans and stuff like that no we are not we are tra- chasing amazing bar speed on our cleans and by doing that i think the outcome is a more uh fruitful athlete on the pitch on the field on the court that they can actually appreciate that man i'm really trying to actually do work and uh, i feel like there's value i'm not just moving the weight i'm moving the weight with intent that's what i think velocity based training has done um, I will say the one thing that um, I've recently, we've just started in the last like six months is we, the, there's an auto-regulation aspect to velocity-based training that the athletes were not comprehending fully. So we have, so this is for the, my personal little sell to everybody is you need to tell the athletes during the lift session and it gets loud and crazy. Every single set that they complete, they need to communicate their previous velocity to you so that you can tell them how to auto-adjust the weight to the next one. And because they're going to try to add too much on a bench press or too much on a single leg and on a bilateral uh, level change, a squat, a deadlift. They're not going to add a, enough. If you know the speeds, you've been doing it long enough. Someone says they're at 0.84, the goal is 0.5. You know that's a 45 pound increase per side. If they say they're at 0.63, you know that it's a, uh, a 10 pound increase per side. They say they're at 0.47 and the goal is 0.5. You look them in the eye, you say, Stay at that weight, but can you not try to go a little faster? And then they come back and they report their report uh, 0.52. Now they're in the zone because they tried harder. That's a great message. Did you try harder? Did you find the weight that you had to fight to keep inside the zone? That's our goal. Now, I've heard you talk about this, that you used Excel to track all of your workouts. Is that something you still do or have you moved into a different way of tracking what you do? Uh, so I still teach my classes. I, I teach a, a 400 level class where I teach them to still build an Excel. And there's some great online resources on YouTube and um, uh, Steve Olson, I think his name, who owns uh, his own software company now. I, I owned his book. That was a great person. Um, Ernie Reimer. Oh, Ernie Reimer is one of the greatest people out there. Um, he's a sports scientist. He's at Louisville. And I remember spending three hours um at multiple conferences, just back-to-back lectures, learning how to use Excel from him. And he's like, I'm not a guru. I'm like, well, if you're not a guru, I don't know what I am. Um, I became really good at Excel, yes. Uh, the problem for me with Excel was how to actually do the data, um, the, to, to input the data. I hate workout cards. I remember at one point I had a football coach that made me go back to workout cards. What happened? We had a ton of workout cards, workout cards lost sweat on the workout cards we don't have enough pins we don't have enough clipboards uh you know just and then what do you do with the data what are you doing to actually make this fruitful so i hated that we went to excel um i started to do some great stuff where it was doing uh estimated one rm comparisons and it was doing comparisons to previous sets and best uh lift ever over a four-year period because i had so many data sets that was some great stuff Uh, But the problem was we didn't have a good way to input it. So we were allowing the athletes to bring their cell phones into the weight room because we didn't have tablets or anything like that. And that created a whole nother issue. I know people that have done it. Like I said, I've encouraged it because I'm like, get away from paper and do something with the data because I don't want some poor GA sitting there doing raw data entry. That's just a waste. Um, We have been fortunate that um, that our velocity-based training uh, equipment, Rep1, uh, comes with its own training software package. So I'm not using anything else like Team Builder or anything like that. We're able to program design in that workout. I can pull out big data sets of CVS or CSV files, and uh, I'm shipping some of that information over the kinesiology department because I'm really great friends with the department chair. Maybe there's a master's level statistics class is doing some processing of the data for us. We're hoping uh, the, the grand overall is we do jump tests before every lift. Once again, I want my test to be my my testing to be my training, my training to be my testing. I don't want to do these vertical jump tests to measure a vertical jump. I want to met you do vertical jumps. And is there a point 
where we can see an inflection of a decrease in their vertical that is a physical decrease in performance that maybe we can correlate once again to some type of cumulative stress or lack of nutrition or improper sleeping patterns or any of the myriad of things that can affect performance. Can we find that with un, within a week? Instead of waiting three months to do a vertical jump test, can we find when is the athlete's body starting to break down? What is that percentage point? Is it going from 100% average to now 91%? It, is it affected by magnitude of change where one guy has a gigantic variance and one person has a very tight variance? What are those numbers? I would love to have a data set to where every week I can run a process report and be like, ooh, that's the person to flag. That's the person that's bodies is starting to show cumulative fatigue over multiple days, but we only figured that out in one week. And now we can report that to the coach and the coach can choose to do what they want with it. That, that athlete at 80% is better than, you know, their, their person behind them on the bench. Fine. And that you made that determination, but also realize you keep pushing them. They're probably going to get injured. Still, they're going to get broken. Um, I, I think doing some of that wonderful stuff would be awesome. And I'm able to do quite a bit of that within our actual training software. So I have left Excel, uh, but I still require my my kinesiology students to practice it because you never know when you're going to be able to build an Excel on your own again. You, you got to talking about YouTube in there, and I looked back over some stuff that you did during COVID. With the future being unknown and we could experience whatever in the future – did you get pretty decent at YouTube where you could get your athletes to watch you and your daughter or you and your dog yeah. or whatever, do these workouts? <laughs> so um, the, the great story about that was, um, you know, that was a really tough time and it was a tough time for collegiate institutions. Cause they're like, do we need to be furloughing people? Where, where, where's the value in people? I mean, my job is I have to be in the weight room. I have to be coaching. I, I can't remotely do that stuff. Well, there's no weight room. And so, my my boss came and he's like, can you do some online training stuff? I'm like, I need to go way above and beyond that. I need to show the value of, of my employment because once again, I've been through stuff at previous institutions where I'm not saying they didn't value me, but maybe they didn't value me enough versus the bottom line. So I started creating these videos on YouTube. Yes, they're still there. Of uh, my daughter's exercising with me. That was totally a a play for an emotional heartstring of, please keep my position. Look at how cute my daughters are. Um, and the dogs running around, but, it, but you know, what's funny, we created a format that ironically it mirrored our program design of two legged bilateral, uh, lifts, unilateral or posterior chain, a push exercise, a pull exercise, some relaxation, breathing, everybody's stressed out. So we recorded some audio for them to work on that, uh, positive quotes by famous, um, philosophers of how to improve your day nutritional suggestions and what's interesting is you know i'm at a, a major fundraiser for the institution eight months later and one of the uh board members comes up to me they're like i loved your videos uh, you know they didn't say they did them but they loved that i was trying to provide a service when everybody was locked down they thought that that was amazing that i was trying to um, provide that i will say also that um, we were one of the very first institutions opened i'm talking like Let's say COVID restriction ended in mid-May. We were open by mid by early June because I went to my athletic trainer and said, I know that if we don't consider this, they won't. They have bigger things on their plate. So we need to come up with the most foolproof plan of sign-up sheets and every other rack, you know, one hour, the odd number racks are being used and then they're sterilized and the next hour is the even number so we can argue that they've been cleaned and we're keeping track and we're doing checks we were open june and my athletes got to lift weights because i knew that they hadn't lift weights in multiple months um we got to lift weights before everybody else when i still had other institution friends where they were still doing body weight exercises out in the middle of the field and i'm sorry body weight exercises is never going to be enough to achieve the demands of sport and the absorption of other people's forces coming into your body. You're not going to get there with tons of calisthenics. So we were able to be ahead of that because I knew I wanted my athletes to start being prepared. Well, that was the year that our football team ended up playing an extended season from September to April. It, it was that spread out. We went to the second semester. Uh, that was our first um, co-conference championship, our first conference championship. I'm not saying I did it, but definitely we were in the right frame of mind of we're going to make sure that they're as prepared as possible. 
Yeah, I went back and watched some of them. I mean, you can only do what you can do, but at least you were able to get something out for your athletes that the ones that were taking it serious at least had something, some sort of communication, or at least felt like they were still dealing with you. Yes. And I think that's a huge, I, I love that word of, they knew that I was still trying to interact with them, even though it was in a remote aspect. And, and I think some other people did some other great jobs of doing like actual, like scheduled body weight workouts and stuff like that. I, it challenged me, man. I mean, coming up with like, uh, taking sheets and put and tying a knot in them and threading them over the bathroom door and shutting the door so that I could do inverted, uh, you know, suspension pull-ups and weight in backpacks, it, coming up with new exercise routines and stuff like that. Yeah, that was significantly challenging. But once again, maybe it made me a better strength coach in the game. I'm sure it did. And I mean, you just reach points where what do you do? Sometimes that's all you can do. And you found an avenue to get to them and it'll be on there forever. You'll have a legacy on YouTube forever. I love that you're still bringing it up. So, <laughs> Well, Coach, I know you're extremely busy. I'm glad you were able to take some time, come on the show. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed yourself. I appreciate it. This was lots of fun. Well, thank you. And hopefully one day I'll get up to Avila, be up around that area and be able to meet you in person. Hey, anytime you want to stop by, please do. Well, thank you very much, Coach, and I hope you have a great evening. Thank you. You too. Good night. <laughs>